Today I'm talking about an end times timeline that had been in this series, a 10-part series, talking about everything from the rapture to the very end. In fact, the end of the age of grace is about to happen. That's one of the things I'll be talking about on today's program. I'm also talking about the 9th of Av. This past Sunday was the 9th of Av with the Jewish people on their calendar. This is the worst day in Jewish history when the first and second temples were destroyed and many other bad things happened. But miraculously, on Sunday, over 1,600 Jews ascended to the top of the Temple Mount and went there to commemorate the 9th of Av. The Israeli police protected them. This is unprecedented. They protected them and they dispersed the Muslim mobs up there that were rioting because the Jews had gone up there. And so a huge transition has happened regarding the Temple Mount, which is end time prophecy. I'm also talking about the United Church of Christ and how they have condemned Israel. They have uh, withdrawn investments from Israel back in 2015. But recently their Senate has now condemned Israel as occupiers of the land of Israel and also the oppressors of the Palestinians. I want to talk about that. I'll be answering questions. One of the questions is uh, if Goliath, uh, if all the giants were supposed to have died in the flood, Noah's flood, which they did, then how did Goliath get there? Because Goliath was a giant after the flood. Okay, I want to answer that. The other is uh, we had a question of why is the Bible so sexist? I want to talk about that. Uh, interesting question. You might be surprised by my answer. And also, if we die before the rapture happens, do we go to purgatory? Do we float around somewhere just waiting on Jesus? Where do we go? I want to tell you exactly what the Bible says about what happens when we die, if we die before the rapture. I'm Jimmy Evans. Welcome to The Tipping Point Show. Hey, welcome to Tipping Point. I have a really great program today. This is the end of a 10-part series that I've been in on the signs of the times in the order of events, an end-time timeline, talking about everything from the rapture and also, you know, the Antichrist and the temple. I talked about the temple last week. All the different things that are going to be an aspect of the end times. We've been talking about that in sequence and today I'm going to talk about the end of the world. There is going to be an end to the world. There's also going to be an end to the age of grace. So this is one thing I want to emphasize during this show today. See, a lot of people take for granted the grace that we have today, but understand it's about to come to an end. There will be a day that no one else can get saved. And that's something that we need to consider. There will be a day that grace goes away. Now, I'll read it to you in Scripture and prove it to you there. So I'm talking about the end of the world. And I, first of all, I want to talk about the great tribulation and the end of God's judgments. Okay, so there's going to be, uh, at the end, there, the tribulation is seven years long. The three and a half years into the tribulation is the abomination of desolation that we're about to read about. And from that point forward, it is the great tribulation. The last three and a half years are worse than the first three and a half years. And here's what Jesus said about it. This is Matthew 24, beginning with verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And so we see in the second half of the tribulation the seven bold judgments, the vile judgments of God, which are horrific and universal. We see uh, Babylon being judged, both commercial and spiritual. Babylon being judged. I'm not going into detail on that because I'm going to talk about that in some future programs. But there is coming a day very soon. Now, you know uh, in hearing me teach on the end times, I believe the rapture is going to be the next major significant uh, prophetic event that happens when the church is raptured before 
the tribulation. We will not be here. But if you've been hearing my teachings that I've been doing on the tribulation, it's horrific. God's wrath is going to be poured out on the world in full measure. And there is going to be horrific judgment. About two-thirds of the world's population is going to die during the tribulation. It's going to be something like it never happened. Jesus said, unless those days have been cut short, no flesh would have survived. And Jesus is the one who coins the term great tribulation. He said there will be great tribulation such as not happened beginning in the middle of the tribulation with the abomination of desolation. This is Revelation 19. After these things, I heard a voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servant shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And so one of the next things that's about to happen is going to be the great tribulation and the end of all God's judgments. In Revelation 19, they're giving God praise because he has finally avenged all sin. He has poured out his wrath. He has uh, avenged on Mystery Babylon, the harlot, the one who has killed the saints and corrupted the earth. And, and I want to say this to you. When you see the sin that's going on in the world right now, every single drop of it will be avenged by God. Nothing, nothing will go unavenged by God during the tribulation and the judgments that everyone will stand in judgment before God. Now, if a person repents and comes to Jesus, they're forgiven. They're, they're given grace until the age of grace ends very soon. But right now, the, you can be forgiven, but all sin, all murder, all crime, all sin, everything that's been done by a human being or by Satan himself, it will be avenged by God. Here's another thing. So that's the way that ends. Here's another part of the end. It's the second coming of Christ and the end of of the age of grace, the second coming. The rapture happens before the tribulation. The rapture is just the church, okay? It is totally private and it's pre-wrath that is before the tribulation. The second coming is totally public. Every eye will see him and it's post-wrath. Jesus talks about it after the tribulation of those days. He's gonna come again. So the age of grace is an age and it ends at the second coming of Jesus. Okay, so I want you to think about that for just a minute. And so if you're a person and you're waiting, you're kind of just, you know, gambling on the fact that maybe Jesus isn't coming. I doubt that very many of you who are watching this are in that position, but maybe you are. And you're just kind of gambling. You are gambling. Now, when the rapture happens, there will be grace during the tribulation period because people can still get saved. We know that by Revelation 20 because it shows us those who are beheaded by the Antichrist because they would not worship him or take the mark of the beast. So it's still possible to get saved during the tribulation. But you are going to live during the worst period of time in human history and your chances of dying are very, very high. Two thirds of the world's population will be dead by the end of the tribulation. So it's gonna be this horrific period of time. And if you're a believer during the tribulation, the Antichrist will do everything he can to kill you if you won't worship him or take the mark of the beast. It, it couldn't be worse. And so, but the end of the age of grace is coming at the second coming. Here's Revelation 19. We just got through reading part of Revelation 19. Here's some more of Revelation 19. Listen now, this is the second coming and I want you to see the disposition now of Jesus in the second coming. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, this is us, by the way, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him 
on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is not sweet Jesus. Now the church has been perfected. We're not the bride of Christ, we're the wife of Christ. The marriage supper of the Lamb has taken place. We are married to Jesus. We return with Him Okay, as He comes back. Remember, we don't need grace at this point because we're perfected. We will never sin again in all of eternity. We are like Jesus. Okay, okay We're not equal to Jesus, but we're His wife and we're like Him. We are in a perfected state. The third area that I want to talk to related to the end is the millennial rule of Christ in the end of the world. We get a lot of questions about this. There is a 1,000 year rule of Jesus that's coming when Jesus returns at the second coming, it begins his 1,000 year rule. Let me show you some scriptures here concerning this. The first is Revelation 20 and it says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now it's absolutely unmistakable based on this scripture that there's going to be a millennial rule of Christ, okay? A thousand year rule of Christ. And those of us who are believers rule and reign with Jesus, including those who get saved during the tribulation period of time, even those who have been beheaded. And so I want to say the end of sin is judgment, eternal judgment. The end of obedience is eternal blessing. And so let me just think this through with you for just a minute. Let's just say you have 50 more years to live. Uh, and let's just say that you're a, a rebel and you're living in sin. You have 50 more years of sin followed by an eternity of damnation and hell and punishment. That doesn't make any sense to, to exchange 50 years of rebellion for an eternity in hell. But let's just say you have 50 more years to live and you live for Jesus and it's difficult. And you're persecuted because of your faith in Jesus. Maybe even beheaded. Maybe even martyred. Would you trade 50 years of obedience for an eternity of blessing and peace and health and love? Every blessing of God that you could possibly think of for all of eternity. It just doesn't make sense to live a life of rebellion and, and rejecting Jesus on this earth when it's followed by an eternity of either life or death or blessing or cursing. We want to live our lives for Jesus. We want to tell others about Jesus so they can avoid hell. Here's another scripture. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven, out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire uh, and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here's the end of Satan and all of those, uh, all the, the rebels against God, all the angelic rebels, is there's going to be eternal damnation after the thousand years. Now these people who have been living under the authority of Jesus for a thousand years will absolutely hate us and they will absolutely hate Jesus. That's why they come down to the camp of the saints, that's us, and that's the beloved city, that's Jerusalem where Jesus rules from. They're going to try to kill us. And Jesus will stop it, he'll judge them all, and he'll throw Satan into the lake of fire. That's the end of Satan. Here's another scripture. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, whose uh, face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not, fit, not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this isn't us. This isn't believers, but this is every single person who's lived 
since the beginning of the world, standing in judgment before God and the book of life is opened. And if they're not found in the book, you know, they're, they go to hell, they're punished. If they are found in the book of life, then I don't know exactly what happens to them, but this is a judgment here. Some people say it's a judgment of hell. Everyone goes to hell. I don't believe that. I believe that these are the people who are not in the church that are judged even before Jesus came to give his life on the cross. And so they're given an opportunity to be judged there and their eternity is, is in the balances. One more scripture and I'm done. This is verse 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard the loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, right, for these words are true and faithful. Listen, those are true and faithful words. And this is exactly what's going to happen. Jesus is coming. All sin will be resolved. Jesus will rule the earth for a thousand years with us. And then there's going to be the, the rebellion by Satan and, and the nations against us and Jesus. God is going to end all of it. And then he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth. Okay, the, the, If you're making your home in this world, I, I, I hope you live in a wonderful wonderful home. Uh, I hope you have a lot of really neat things around you. They're all going to go up in fire. Not one single thing that we have materially is going to survive. The heavens and the earth are going to burn up and God's going to create new heavens, new earth. The new earth, by the way, has no ocean. There is no sea in it. Imagine a world, a perfected world where there's never been a sin committed. There's no pollution. It's an absolutely pristine world that's brand new along with the new universe. And this is what God is going to do. Those of us who are believers, you just can't, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. It's beyond our comprehension what we're looking forward to. But I can tell you this, it is worth it to serve Jesus Christ. It is worth it to be persecuted for Jesus, to be uh, ostracized for Jesus. Whatever happens, take, take it in this world because you're going to end up in the life hereafter where you're going to be rewarded for all of eternity and be able to enjoy these unbelievable things that are about to happen in the world. But for sinners and those who reject Jesus, it could not be worse. And so Jesus is coming. He's about to come and take us. And so that's the comfort I give you today. I'm about to go in now to end the news segment and answer your questions. If you're not a subscriber, I'm going to say goodbye to you. I wish you would be a subscriber. $7 a month, $77 a year, endtimes.com. Go on there and subscribe your first month. If you go on the monthly, uh, your first month is free, so you can check us out. You can see all of our archives and see what, what happens. Make sure it's worth your money. We would love to have you be a subscriber, but if you're not a subscriber, I'm going to say goodbye to you. If you are a subscriber, stay tuned because we're going to talk about some important things coming up.